one thing that I've realized, both with Slater Kinney and with Portlandia, like they're so singular, and I to recreate that is almost impossible. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz, and this is where I have conversations with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. We talk about creativity and the creative process. And on the show today, one of my favorite people, all around people, indie rock and sketch comedy legend, Carrie Brownstein. So it is not an uncommon thing for a well-known actor to venture into the world of music or like a rock and roll star to try their hand at acting. And, you know, often the results are, well, not that great. That is, unless you are Carrie Brownstein. Carrie founded the band Slater Kinney back in the 90s in Olympia, Washington. She was named one of the 50 greatest guitarists of all time by Spin Magazine. And she's also a songwriter and sometimes vocalist for the band. She's written about music. She's written about art for magazines and for journals. She's also one of the creative forces behind one of the funniest and one of my favorite TV shows of the 2010s, Portlandia. So in my conversation with Carrie, you will find out how Slater Kitty found the key to their sound in actually an out-of-tune guitars. Uh, You will find out about the moment of crisis that led the band to take a year-long hiatus and about how she got over her nerves and found her place in the writer's room at Portlandia. So before we get into my interview with Carrie, here's what you need to know. She grew up just outside of Seattle in the 1980s. It was suburban. It was sort of bordering on rural. There was a feed store right across from uh, the bookstore downtown. Um, But when she was around 10 years old, an office park sprung up where a forest used to be, and a new company called Microsoft moved in. Um, A few years later, another shift happened in Carrie's own home that would similarly change everything. You were 14 when your parents split up? Yeah. And you and your sister went to live with your dad, right? Yeah, or we stayed with my dad, actually. Yeah, my mom moved out. What did that mean? I mean, did 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 you see your mom, like, on weekends or regularly, or, 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 or was she kind of out of the picture for a while? She was still in the picture for a little while. You know, I... It's now that I'm an adult, I have so much empathy for her and for her experience. And, you know, I can see probably the ways that being married to my father, who didn't know he was gay, but was gay and came out later as gay, like that must have been a lonely existence for her. And she was, you know, battling a yeah. uh, an eating disorder and... um and depression. So I have a lot of uh, empathy for her. But as a a child, I was angry and confused, you know, to um, to feel like she was choosing herself over us, you know, and it's more complicated than that. But as a child, you're just like, I need a mom. And now she's leaving. So we didn't see her a lot. Um, Once she moved out, she was kind of working on her herself and aiming to get better. So yeah, after that, it was really just my dad and my sister and I. And you were like, as a kid, kind of um, like you were comfortable performing in front of other people. Like I, right. Like you've talked about how you would like do plays with your sister and, and just perform. And did you not, did you have like no, uh, I don't know, um, just like no fear of, of just getting up in front of people and. It's so strange because, I, yeah, I was watching this video that my dad found that we had made for my grandparents, for his parents, for their birthday, one of their birthdays. And, you know, they're videotaping us on this VHS camera and everyone's like sort of just giving this message to, you know, happy birthday, grandma. My voice is the volume of a football coach. Like, I just feel like, why am I so on right now? Like, everyone else is just doing this normal thing. And I just, I enter the frame, like, you know, I'm just like hyping up the team. And I I couldn't stand it. I was like, well, I must have been just super annoying. But I think f- for me, it was, you know, and I did write about this in the book, just a way of, it was easier, I think, to sort of operate in that mode in my family, you know, it was harder to be vulnerable and, you know, the, the quiet moments and, 
you know, were, were full of fear and uncertainty, but performing just kind of drew this boundary around all that was going on. And, you know, I sort of understood the assignment. It was like, oh, okay, this is my job. This is my task. I'm here to perform or I'm here to entertain or I'm going to, you know, get my sister or all the neighborhood kids to join me in this, mm-hmm. you know, folly or this Duran Duran cover band or whatever I was doing. Like that structure, I think I really needed that because it wasn't really kind of coming from my parents. And so I think it was just a way for me to kind of communicate and and survive. And I, it, it was the other moments that were a lot harder for me, just kind of sitting in the, in the stillness and sitting in the kind of strangeness and just not knowing really what was happening. I, was, I think I was pretty scared. Um, yeah, but I, I was, I would call it just bordering on obnoxious when I think back to it, but it was fun. I mean, it was, fun. I don't, I shouldn't judge myself, but it was, it was loud. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and and I think, I mean, did you grow up, I know you, you got your first guitar when you were like 15, but did you grow up doing piano lessons or any other instruments at all? Yeah, I took piano probably when I was eight or nine for maybe five years. I really was ready to move move on quickly from the Bartok and Beethoven to Madonna's Like a Virgin. You know, like I yeah. I always was, I, I had the We Are of the World uh, sheet music and the Like a Virgin <laughs> sheet music. And, wow. you know, I'm sure my piano teacher was like, please, let's, let's work on this, you know, Bach. And I'm like, nope, right. can we, can we do Like a Virgin? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I really did enjoy learn. It was a good foundation for just learning some basic you know, music theory. And it, um, I didn't love practicing, but I loved playing, you know, the formality of it was hard, but I I loved it as a form of expression. So when you, um, got your first guitar, um, was it, was it, I mean, both of my kids play piano and I think they started on on violin, um, and that didn't last very long. Um, and piano they've taken to sort of, we do have to get on, get on them to practice, but did you, like, did you just connect with a guitar in a different with a guitar in a different way than you did with the piano? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons for that. Now that I think about it, one was the piano was in you know a common area of the house. There was sort of this sense that yeah. it was public and that you know p- people were listening to me for because I was practicing. You know, it was it like you're saying we got to get on the kids for to practice and i right. i did feel that yeah. whereas guitar it was like you take it and you bring it into your room and in you're your in your room yeah you're in this like private sanctum and even though it's loud I, just having the walls around me and and this, this sense of privacy which you really need for creativity and expression and it, it um it also i think just aligned with the music i was listening to at the time you know it was by the time i got a guitar it was you know early, early nineties, I guess it was probably 1990. And the, you know, some of that keyboard piano music was sort of leaving the airwaves and, yeah, yeah. um, and it just, the guitar just has a different mode of expression, you know, the notes bend so that they can, can conjure like sorrow. They can kind of wail, you know, depending how hard or soft you hit the strings. Like there was just, it, it felt physical in a way I really needed. And um, also, yeah, it just aligned with the music I was listening to. So it was different, for sure. What were you listening to? I, I, I remember that era so well, obviously, because I was alive. And I just heard, <laughs> by the way, just heard um, Everything Counts by Depeche Mode on oh. the on the radio. And it's all synthesizers, but man, it's so good. They were totally revolutionary, and they don't get enough credit for what they did because they were making so many – they were basically an electronic music band in the 80s, and they were making amazing music. Yeah, those records still hold up, I think, for sure. They hold up. All right, so what So what, what do you remember listening to in, in around 1990? I think that's right when I got into high school, and – I kind of transferred friend groups at that point, you know, like I was, I, I looked around and, um, I was like, I guess I'm not, you know, you're just trying to figure out like who, who are my people yeah. in, in high school, especially cause it just like grades, like suddenly everything counts in high school. You're like, I don't, I don't think I can keep up with these, these sort of 
popular kids, which I definitely wasn't. So I, I started seeking out these groups of people who at the time were called bat cavers. <laughs> and the bat cavers uh, were, at, it's, I guess it was kind of a um, amalgamation of the, the rockers and the goths and the punks. Um, and so anyway, we all had to hang out together because, you know, there were, yeah, even though we listened to different kinds of music, it was like, well, we're the kids that wear, you know, eye, black eyeliner and dyer hair and, you know, wear cut off jean shorts and combat boots and, um, Doc Martens. Y'all Doc, Martens. Doc Martens. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, beca- but because, you know, I had all these friends who listened to different styles of music, I just, I started this, like, it was just this huge tutorial for me, you know, and, um, hmm. it was like, okay, discovering the church and discovering ministry and hmm. Depeche Mode, but then also, you know, Ramones and Patti Smith and The Clash. You know, I was just, I just was voracious for, I, I just suddenly realized there was all this music that was happening at the moment, but that I had also missed because, of course, in the 80s, I was just listening to the radio. Yeah. And, you know, and there were great things on the radio. I mean, that was the era of Michael Jackson and Madonna, and there was incredible pop music. But I didn't realize that at the same time, there were bands like the Dead Kennedys or that, you know, this band called Television from New York or, you know, just mm. all this music I had missed. And so... I then spent, you know, sophomore and junior year of high school just, just completely immersed in the learning of of music and um and then of course there were things starting to happen in Seattle. Yeah. Mudhoney, Nirvana, uh smaller bands like Hammerbox, um and Fastbacks and Beat Happenings, so things out of Olympia and that's when that started for me. Um and I actually Yeah, I mean the- could listen to that. Sorry, keep going. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean the 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 year you graduated high school, that was because Nevermind came out in the fall of of ninety one, mm-hmm. and I mean you, the year you graduated ninety two, like they were the big they were the biggest band in the world. They blew up. Seattle was about to become like the the music capital of the world for the next few years. Yeah, remember that movie Hype? Yes. I mean, that was such a weird, yeah, you know, it was just basically about that, which just all of these like major labels, like descending upon Seattle and just signing anybody with a pulse, you know, with a, with a distortion pedal, pedal and a pulse. They were like, you're next. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember driving to school the morning that um, Smells Like Teen Spirit came out and I was a senior and um, the end, 107.7. Uh, was like, they're, this is the new song by Nirvana. And of course, for us, they were just like a local band. Yeah, That DJ played Smells Like Teen Spirit ad infinitum. He did not stop. I mean, there, and this is a mainstream radio station. He played it and then he played it again. He, and then I, so the whole way to school, the whole soundtrack was one wow. song. And I just remember <laughs> thinking, oh, I think the, whole, the weather has just changed. Like it really, like... I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was like, this is unprecedented. When has a song ever been played so much? But it was like a shock to the system. And then, of course, they completely blew up. But I I remember um, also that year, a little ad in the the Rocket, which was Seattle's like music paper advertising a show. It was Bikini Kill, Mud, Honey, and Nirvana. And of course, it had been booked before the album was released. So it was at like the yeah. more the more theater, which holds like, you know, 1,500 people. And that was the show that was going to be that fall. And then um, at the beginning of, in 1992, when I started college in, in Bellingham, which was Western Washington University, uh, Mud, Honey were playing. And like that September, like right at the beginning of school. And then we heard like, oh, Nirvana's going to do a surprise show. So... I went to just a show at the basically college gymnasium where Nirvana opened for Mud Honey just because they were all friends. Wow. And it was probably one of the best experiences of my life. You know, this was wow. a band that globally was just taking over. And here they were hanging out with their friends up in Bellingham, a small town, you know, right on the border of Canada, just playing to a bunch of college kids that, of course, at the time just had no idea what it would mean or, you know, that... Yeah, that Nirvana were about to just be the biggest band in the world and one of the most influential bands to come around. But 
yeah, they played and then my daddy got on after them. <laughs> It was so weird. It was a crazy time. Did you did you did you like the music that was coming out? Did you like um because you know obviously there'd be Soundgarden and obviously Pearl Jam and um um God I'm blanking but um my, yeah Mud Honey and um so many others. I mean, did you were you into into that music? Did 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 it resonate with you? It did. I think that I don't know. I mean, I think I just was. I just had that porousness, that openness at the time to try anything, you know, that if yeah. if I went to see a band, you know, Tree People, which were the band that Doug Marsh was in before Built to Spill, you know, they, you know, they would play or um, I remember this band called Crevice from Vancouver. They had like eight guitar players, just eight female <laughs> guitar players, just a total cacophony. Wow. But wow. I just was, I was willing to experience whatever and I would buy the seven inches and you know, Seven Year Bitch or um, The Gits. Like there were just a, t a ton of cool bands. But uh, yeah, I mean, Soundgarden, it's weird because I do remember at the time, even though these were, bands were certifiably amazing with, you know, amazing singers like Chris Cornell or Eddie Vedder, I was still seeking out, like, I was like, but where are the women? Like, I still want it, you know, so I was like drawn to Olympia, which, you know, Bikini Kill and Heavens to Betsy and all these other bands were kind of happening, concomitant yeah. to the Seattle stuff. So even though I, I loved Soundgarden and Nirvana and knew they were great, at the time you didn't, you know, you don't know that these bands are going to disappear. Yeah. You don't know that tragedy will befall them or that they're not going to be around forever. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, they're cool. But what about this super obscure band called Ratmobile out of Olympia? So, you know, I just, I, yeah, I, I liked it all. But I, I definitely was kind of seeking out something that spoke directly to me at the time. As like an 18 or 19 year old, like, you know, Bikini Kill, when I first heard their music, I just thought, oh, I mean, someone is saying out loud the things that I've been feeling for so long. And that is a much more radical, life-changing feeling. I want to ask you about that um, and getting to, um, to Olympia and, and to Evergreen State College. But before I forget, like in high school, you were also, I think like definitely in like the last year of high school, you were also kind of like a theater kid. Like you were like a drama nerd, right? You were the star of the high school play. Right. And I mean, when you say the word star, we should, <laughs> we should you know, explain <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> being a star of a high school play that the English teacher wrote, <laughs> you know, um, which when I think back, I just, I love the hubris of that. Like, oh, there's all of these plays we could do, but I have a play. <laughs> let's do mine. Let's do I my mean, play. Let's workshop it. You know what? He, and uh, <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so I was in that play and I, I was the lead. Um, but yeah, I really did enjoy that. And in middle school as well, I I loved theater and um, did drama and improv and all that stuff was really fun. But when music came along, it just had a more immediate sense of gratification. And also, it just lacked that kind of formalism that, you know, when you're doing a play, you're still, there's sort of still this like top-down hierarchy and you've got the director and you've got all this stuff, which of course is great, but I just wanted yeah. to be like on my own terms, on my own time, as loud as possible. You know, that just was so appealing to me. So music took over for a while. One of the things I'm curious about is because you got to you you eventually went to Evergreen State College, you transferred there and and you would get there at a time which you wouldn't have known at the time, but but now we know it was like this kind of historic moment in 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 the history of music. I mean you had, I mean, Corn Tucker, Kathleen Hanna, uh, Toby Vale, Becca Alby, all these people you'd collaborate with, they were all there. Kathleen Hanna, of course, of Bikini Kill, who started this whole Riot Girl movement. But be before I ask you about that, I'm curious because our generation, right, the most egregious sin you could commit was earnestness, right? It was like the worst thing you could be. You, you had to be ironic or just – it was – you know, sort of dismissive of everything. Do you know what I mean? It was like that was a thing, especially at that time in our lives. Do you remember that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, if you just watch Reality Bites, like to me, that's such a <laughs> distillation of what you're talking about, that right. that Ethan Hawke character yeah. or the Janine Garofalo, you know, character. But yeah, there, there was definitely, there was so much rejection of things, you know, including 
yeah, earnest, earnestness was kind of anathema. You know, you just, you really moved through the world with just kind of a, a disgust and a... An eye roll. An yeah. eye roll. Yeah, it was just, yeah, yeah it was... It's strange to think about now because I feel like earnestness is so valued and authenticity is so valued. <laughs> yeah. um, right. But at the time, you know, that just – that didn't feel like something that you could really embrace. Although, I guess ironically, like there there were sort of these rules to that though. You you know, you, you had the sense of irony, but then – you really had to take seriously other things like selling out was something. Selling out was the worst thing you that could was do. The worst thing you could the do. The worst. And and now that concept, I mean, barely exists if at no. all. You know, it's no. it's it's actually worse. Every, to... every celebrity has a cosmetics line now. Yeah. So that there were there were a lot of rules <laughs> to follow, I guess. When you were at when you got to Evergreen State in ninety five, I'm sure there were lots of people like Nirvana sold out. They've sold out, right? Like that was a thing that people would say. Or like all those bands, they've sold out. Yeah, for sure. And well, you know, it's interesting because Nirvana had a, a very close ties to Olympia. You know, they had grown up in Aberdeen, right. which is actually much closer to Olympia than Seattle. Um, Kurt had, you know, girlfriends and friends in Olympia. Um, you know, they played at the the Mods, which is a housing um, complex at Evergreen. You know, they and so I think there were there was a lot of sympathy for. Nirvana. I don't think I actually don't remember people calling Nirvana sellouts. I think it was more of a almost a cautionary tale. Like everyone knew mm -hmm. how special they were and how special their music was, and I think it was more witnessing the pain of what that could do to someone, you know, that yeah. It was so sensitive and suddenly up against people uh, or a, he had a sense that, you know, his audience was different from who he was and didn't understand. And I think, I think it, yeah, it operated more as just kind of a warning than, um, than it wasn't met with criticism, but there certainly were bands that came after that. You know, if you signed to a major label, you know, then you were suddenly too commercial. Yeah. And, you know, the goal was not to be commercial. I mean, I remember when Slater Kinney wanted a, publicist. Like there was a woman, Julie Butterfield, who had moved from the big city of Minneapolis to uh, Olympia. And, you know, people that come from bigger cities are like, hey, you guys, we could be doing this. We, you could actually hire someone to try to get your songs on the radio or to send uh, your album out to a journalist. And we were scared to hire a publicist because, you know, Riot Girl had basically done a media blackout. It was like, we're not going to talk to the media. Yeah. So even just the idea of promoting yourself was selling out. I mean, it it's hard to explain how strict and strident those rules were, how codified and how, I mean, this was a conversation that was was constant and and treacherous. Um, yeah, it's it was hard. <laughs> I lived in Washington, D.C. in the late 90s, so there's a, a, a D.C., Olympia Riot Girl connection because I think Kathleen Hanna spent some summers in DC and like performed with a lot of musicians there. And so that whole movement was very present and especially in like the alternative weekly magazines, newspapers that I wrote for. Um, was Tell me about that. I mean, you get to Olympia and like Kathleen Hanna's there and Bikini Kills there and you're a musician and, and you know, what, what, like, were you immediately drawn to to those women to be around them, to be around what they were trying to build? Yeah. I mean, it's half the reason. Well, actually, no, it's 99% of the reason I went to Olympia because when right. I was at Western uh, Heavens to Betsy, which featured Corin Tucker and Tracy Sawyer, but Corin is who I formed Slater Kinney with, they came to Bellingham to perform. I went up to Corin afterwards, and she literally said, "You you should just move to Olympia," and it was. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I guess I should." So I, you know, I really was moving there, yes, for college, but also because it just felt like that's where I would find my people, and I wanted to be, you know, immersed in this music scene. So yeah, when I got there, I arrived during the summer. I had about two months before school started, and I just tried to go to every show, which literally were happening all the time. And bands would, 
who were like a band like Rancid, who um, were getting pretty big at the time, or Jawbreaker, yeah, Mary Lou Lord, Elliot Smith, they would they would play these basement shows, you know. So they would, or you know, Beck was recording an album with Calvin Johnson at the time. You know, people were would stop in Olympia despite playing big places in Seattle or then San Francisco, and they would just hang out for a few days. They would play these basement shows, and you know, maybe record a, a seven inch with, with Calvin at his studio. And so I just had access to so much great music just in the, in a basement. And so, yeah, I, I really just spent so much of my time just as a student really of, of performance and sonics, you know, I would look f- I was so up close to, you know, what someone's amp setting was or how someone played guitar. It was, you know, I was just under the tutelage of this kind of collective force of of artistry. And yeah, I mean, I kind of was just a puppy dog. I really would just follow people around. And this, you know, you talked about me being sort of gregarious and confident as a kid, but I really, this was certainly the sh- the shyest, most diffident time of my life. And I, I think to some extent after my mom left, there was a huge dip in my confidence and self-esteem. So when I entered this world, I really was looking for some kind of foundation and solidity and just guidance. Um, So I was just an observer for a long time there Um, and eventually started a band with Becca Albee, Excuse 17. But I, I just, I spent a lot of time watching and listening. So there wasn't like, um, you wouldn't sort of, go up to 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 people you met and say hey do you want to like just you know play some music together you wouldn't just sort of do that you would literally you wouldn't like <laughs> imagining like you wouldn't like walk around town with your guitar like waiting to find people to jam with you would just kind of observe other people well doing- i oh sorry to interrupt you i was no i was making friends but there's you know you kind of had to find people who weren't already playing music. That was hard. Everyone already had a band or five bands. So I remember, uh, yeah, when I met Becca, who was a visual artist and conceptual artist and, you know, but she played music, she played guitar, she was from the East Coast. So she was bringing in all these interesting um, influences like, you know, the throwing muses or, Mm. uh, you know, just things that um, Mission of Burma just, you know, everyone kind of brought in their own sort of field of expertise music wise. And so, yeah, I I think I would never have gone up to Kathleen and said, let's, do you want to play music? But I would, you know, I, I found people who were sort of young and up and coming and I was less afraid to, to play with them. What did it mean to be like, I mean, was, was, I mean, there, there was a movement, called Riot Girl. It was there was a manifesto. There was a like an an ethos and an aesthetic. And what did that mean to you? Did you did you feel like you were formally part of something? Did you hang out with people? Did did it feel like you were in that world or that scene or or was it just less specific and more abstract? I think for me it was the latter, but I you know, Corin Tucker, who at the time was in Heavens to Betsy and then would be in Slater Kinney with me, she was much more um, a part of Riot Girl. There were, there was, a f- you know, there were zine, fanzines and meetings and, and things that you could I- engage in more directly. Um, and that had happened a little bit before I arrived in Olympia. So when I got there, there was definitely, yeah, the ethos of Riot Girl, and it, um, but it had already kind of become this thing that the the media, the mainstream media, had latched onto. And again, at the time, once the mainstream media got a hold of something, it was just dead to us. So you know, yeah. we were already trying yeah. to extricate <laughs> extricate ourselves from something that had right. sort of been been poisoned. You know, and also I think there was just that that sense of um, just rejection of this idea that Riot Girl was a music genre because really it was describing so little in terms of what the various bands sounded like. You know, it was hard to kind of pinpoint what is a Riot Girl band. So people were starting to to sort of 
find a workaround. But I think it it definitely informed the way that people thought about politics in Olympia. You know, there was a a very matriarchal thread. You know, there were a lot of women even before Kathleen, mm-hmm. uh, Lois Maffeo, and Stella Mars, uh, who had, you know, really, yeah, made their mark in terms of just, you know, how Olympia would be structured. Candace Peterson, who was running K with Calvin. So it was it was a very special scene. So that that had already kind of that was sort of already in the water there, percolating, but it was it was not as much um described within the scene as Riot Girl. It was just part of the politics and how we talked about things. When you and Corin Tucker got together to form Slater Kinney in, in nineteen ninety four, um it was a side project for I think for her for both of you kind of but how did you start to form the sound that you would eventually you know express in your music because certainly i mean especially in the 90s it was so distinctive i mean the the guitar and her voice and and your harmonies and and backing vocals it was just so different how do you remember like workshopping i workshopping might not be the right word but just like grinding through the sound that you would put together. Yeah, that's that's a good question because I, there definitely was not a lot of forethought. It was not something that we sat down and said, "Okay, this is these are influences. Here's our skill set. You've got this voice. I can sort of play guitar." <laughs> you know, like it, it just it really was just the alchemy, I think. Uh when it started to cohere with more intention, was strangely when we went to Australia, which is, as a listener, I'm sure people are like, why did you go to Australia? And that is a question I can't fully answer. But we, you know, Corin was graduating and I was able to basically take like a quarter of like independent study. (laughs) So I went to Australia supposedly to study, but really Corin and I just went there and kind of more officially started Slater Kinney there. At that point, our other bands were kind of dissipating. And it was in Australia yeah. that we had never... So in Corin's earlier band, Heavens to Betsy, did not have uh, any other guitarists or bass players. It was just her and a drummer. So she only tuned to her voice. She never had a tuner. So, you know, I'm sure some days she was in E, other days she was, you know, potentially was tuning down a drop D or who knows where. Just yeah. um, So obviously when you start playing with another stringed instrument, you have to tune or any other instrument. If you have anybody else playing along with you, you got to figure out the tuning. Um, yeah. So in Australia, one day we just thought, well, we're very out of tune. So let's just figure out what the tuning is by accident. Or this is where her guitar was on the day. It was C sharp. So that's, you know, one and a half step downs, one and a half steps down from standard E tuning. Uh, but it definitely creates already this 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 dissonance, this kind of murkiness. And I think a little bit of mystery. It's just it has a a different feel for sure. And I think that was one of the first things that really created the sound of Slater Kinney. You know, it it forced Corin's voice into this range that was a lot higher. (laughs) And uh, at the time we kind of, yeah, just cobbled together two different guitar parts. But so there was that moment and then a moment in our practice space where we were, I had been writing this thing that would turn into I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone, which was a song on Call the Doctor. And I just remember we were facing each other in the practice space, which was a storage space, by the way, a storage space lined with Mm. uh, carpet and mattresses and for soundproofing. And she started singing the chorus. And I just started doing this kind of like squeal, like, whoa, whoa. And it was just this weird back and forth thing. And we suddenly realized like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I couldn't really sing. I still can't really sing. I'm sort of a personality punk singer. But, you know, I was just, just trying to find my way into the song. And we we just realized we had this weird dynamic that we could employ over and over again. And then we really got into that as a as a way of 
you know, working through the song. So those are the two biggest moments was that Joey Ramone and then the C sharp tuning. When you, um, you released your first record, um, the first record called Slater Kinney, it was reviewed by Robert Criscow, who gave a really great review. The first one, the self-titled one? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that? You didn't know that he gave it a great review? Maybe he did it years later. I don't know. I mean, Maybe I- he came out years later. I know he was a fan because I remember meeting him during the Call the Doctor tour, but I didn't know that he had actually re- reviewed the first album. So when you came back to Olympia, I mean, you still had another two years of college and you had this band. You were now in a band that was getting some attention and people were talking about, were you like all of a sudden like a campus celebrity? No, (laughs) not at all. Uh, No, not at all, really? No. I mean, again, like there was, it was almost scary to get attention there. It's kind of that tall poppy syndrome where, you know, so much you know, you would know this from DC too. Like there was just always a sense that everything had to go back to the community, you know, back, you know, like yeah. we were all sort of part of this movement. No one was any more important or, you know, more, I don't know, crucial than anyone else. Yeah. There. Um, so I think if anything, we just kind of kept our heads down and uh, yeah, we didn't, it didn't really seem to affect anything in Olympia, I think, except to maybe make me feel a little more self-conscious. And at the time, Corinne left, which, you know, she went to Portland, which was the big city at the time. And I, I think part of it was just that feeling that Olympia was was small and could have that kind of deleterious effect of just not allowing one to sort of even enjoy you know, these, these moments where you should be yeah. sort of feeling proud or celebratory. Um, yeah, so it was it was scary, I guess, to have any attention on oneself. You made three records in three years. Cause you, you made, I mean, basically three records while you were still in college, while you were st- like doing your degree. Yes. So <laughs> would mean, you we go were, back? Uh, yeah. We recorded. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, I think Call the Doctor, we recorded in five days and Dig Me Out in 10. So, you know, it's not taking wow. up a lot of time. Well, but you were writing music and you were like trying to work out the song. So it was it was like the recording is one thing, but putting those albums together is another thing. Um, and so was Corn coming up from Portland? Because she'd graduated already. She had graduated. Yes, she was coming up. By the time we were doing Dig Me Out, she was living in Portland and, and coming up to Olympia for us to to write. Um, and then, yeah, and we were writing a little bit in Portland as well. I'm curious about just the business side of this for a moment because we, you know, we, we hear like music from artists we love and I think we make a lot of assumptions about what that means, that there's riches and there's, you know, nothing to worry about, um, and everything's sorted out. But I wonder like, how did that work? Did you, I mean, you were signed to a label and, Um, I guess it's like a book that you get in advance and then you make the records. And did you, did you think that, um, I don't know, did you feel like, okay, we're set, like we've got a record contract, like we're, we're good to go. I like that you imagine we had a record contract because I don't think we ever had a, I don't think we ever had a formal contract (laughs) with, uh, Kill Rock Stars. Um, we did have a 50, 50 profit split, which is rare, but it was more common with especially independent labels and was one of the things that created that dichotomy between indie and major, you know, where yeah. ostensibly at the time, if you were on an independent label, you felt like you had a little more control and that you might make a little more money. Um, so we basically split the expenses up front, but then what it meant was if we started to make a profit, we were getting 50% instead of just points, which is, you know, one or two percent, maybe up to five percent of the profits. Of course, if you get points, you also get an advance, which is nice because you get a check and you can live for a while and use that money to, you know, pay the rent while you write songs. So, you know, there's there's pros and cons. But at the time, people did buy physical albums Records. and, and yeah. CDs. And so even for us, you know, I think dig me out when it first came out, it was actually sold out immediately. Like they didn't press enough, but it did yeah. sell, you know, it started to sell 50, 60,000 records, which I think it sold like almost a hundred thousand copies. It did eventually, but that, you know, so yeah. suddenly I, w- we were actually getting 
checks and they weren't huge, but at the time for someone who had never made any money except working like crap part-time jobs, it, it was amazing. And it wasn't a lot, but it was definitely surprising. And it, yeah, it was, I mean, just the fact that you could make money from recording and touring, which I think is a lot harder now to do for any, on any level. Yeah. So when you graduated, I mean, you were, I mean, you guys had three records out. You're in a band that was getting a lot of attention um, and touring. And what do you remember about that? I mean, you were like 23, you know, 24, probably when, when the Hot Rock came out, which, I mean, that record is, all those records are amazing. And by the way, he, I have a question. I'm curious about this because the Hot Rock, for example, that comes out when you're 24, right? And when I go back and I read this stuff I wrote when I was 24 for the Washington City paper, I'm like, oh, God, this is horrible. Or I feel – but at the same time, like it, w I I'm really proud of it at a certain level because I was – that was – I was – it was what I was – you know, what I was doing was still at the top of my abilities at the time. But I listen to the Hot Rock now and I'm like, this is – this album could be released now and it's amazing. When you hear that record, do you hear yourself like – less evolved version of yourself? Or do you hear that and say, that was a great album? Well, to be honest, I haven't listened to that record in a long time. But I guess right. if I did, no, I am proud of that record. There is something very strange and mysterious about the hot rock to me because it was so different than Dig Me Out. And I do remember that we purposely yeah. did that. Despite you know me saying that at, there there weren't a lot of things that we planned at the beginning. We didn't have, we didn't have like a 10, a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. You know, we didn't think about a lot of things that bands and artists just have to think about now, or, you know, there was something always a little understated about things from the Pacific Northwest. You know, there weren't a lot of logos necessarily. Like, you know, we were just different than bands from LA or New York. So, but I will say that we did, I think, have enough wherewithal and we felt a lot of scrutiny after Dig Me Out that we just made a very different record. And it was for all the ways that Dig Me Out had this kind of like condensed, like just, it was so fast and just kind of re unrelenting, you know, Hot Rock just, it was all the, it was like two conversations at once. It was as if we just took all of that energy and kind of made it like diffuse and strange and more about exploration. And so I don't know quite how we did that record, honestly. it All the songs to me are a mystery on it. Like Get Up, such a strange song. I don't know mm. how. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I do like that record. I think it's really hard to play live. I, we never, that was never a record that we could play live very well. I think there's only like two songs on it that were conducive to playing live. Cause it's just so labyrinthine. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. I, I, I don't know, but I don't, it's like, I don't have a sense of it. I, it is weird to me that I was 24. When you started to get attention, um, for your music, I mean, even before you graduated college, um, I mean, and you write, write about this, like there was an article in spin that talked about, um, a song in, on, on Dig Me Out and, and in that, in that song you referenced, a brief relationship that you and Corn had, and then Spin wrote about it, and that was like the first time anyone had ever heard of it. And your dad called you, I guess, and was like, "Hey, what's this? Like, tell me." First of all, when you start to get attention for being, you know, for making music and getting mainstream like attention from Spin, Rolling Stone, other places, um, do you, what do you remember about like about your? dad or your mom or like just how they reacted to that did they just were they just blown away by it were they like wait what this is incredible you just graduated college and you're like in spin magazine i think for my parents particularly my dad and my grandparents were still around at the time i think they were still a little confounded by this choice you know i growing up in a in a family every you know everyone were everyone, they were professionals, you know, and I think that yeah. my dad especially kind of kept waiting for me to sort of grow out of this kind of, you know, musician phase. And I think at the time <laughs> I was still really 
certain I would go to graduate school and do something mm. else. Um, so I can't remember what it was that really cemented it. For my grandparents, it must have been something like you being in USA Today. <laughs> you know, you got it. Right. You got it. You got to get you into made, those. <laughs> you made USA Today. I, right. Or Time Magazine. I think Time there magazine. was. Yeah. Things like that. Th- those are the things that really help translate for yeah. your for your parents at the time, you know, because it was pre-internet. Um, so you needed those like old school publications to to give you that validation. So yeah, I mean, everyone was supportive. No one was ever, no one in my family ever said like, you need to quit or anything. But I think they just weren't sure of the longevity of it, even though they were all coming to the shows and were excited. I don't know how much they loved the music, but they <laughs> they were supportive. It's funny. I just interviewed Issa Rae a couple of days ago, and she said the first time her father, who was a um, a pediatrician, ever was like, you know, just acknowledged her work was was when she she was interviewed on NPR. He's like, "You were on NPR. I heard you on NPR. Like she's been on HBO for two years, you know." <laughs> Yeah, no, that it's very true. It's like you have to be on like one of five things and then your parents are like, aha, I get it. It's, you know what it is? Yeah. It's something that they have to be able to tell their friends. That's what I realized. Like yeah. NPR yeah. is something that, you know, someone's- My, kid, my daughter was on NPR. Yeah, they're like, ah, oh, I hear, get it. T- did yeah. you Robert Siegel? Talk to, talk to Carrie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I, when I when I started out on NPR, my parents would say, "Oh, so because they didn't, ever, I didn't grow up listening to it. We didn't grow up listening." And they would say, "When are you going to be on television?" <laughs> um, that's they would ask me back in the in the early days. Um, so, all right, so this this is interesting because this is in like ninety seven. This article comes out, you know, when you talk or talks about this brief relationship that the two of you had, and then like a year later, your dad would come out. Like all of these things were were happening. So, um, first of all, I mean, when your dad came out to you was it like a relief like oh my god this is or or was it a shock to you were you surprised what what do you remember about that it was very surprising you know i think hmm. people assume that there would be clues or that you know right that, that we always would have you know guessed uh for one like in the in the suburbs and in like when i was in school nobody came out in, you know, as a kid, like you just, if you even knew what it meant to be queer and which a lot of people didn't, I truly didn't even really understand what that was. Um, It just wasn't talked about. So that vocabulary really didn't exist. Uh, Obviously by the time my dad came out, you know, I had been entrenched in a scene that where there were a lot of queer people. And that was, you know, much more like normal and common. But anyway, so with my dad, you know, he had been this very like suburban kind of suit and tie wearing corporate lawyer. Um, You know, like I said, big Duke Blue Devils fan, just soccer, (laughs) soccer coach, Uh, you know, just as, as sort of like, classic archetypal dad as you can get. Yeah. And and even after he and my mom split up, he had girlfriends, you know, and in fact, he, when he came out, he had, I think was maybe still dating uh, someone, a a woman, um, or had just broken up with her. There were no clues at all, nothing. Uh, Yeah. I mean, you know, looking back, I can definitely see moments like, there was this catalog that would arrive at the house. It was an it's a men's underwear catalog called International Mail, and I don't know why we had it, but <laughs> all it was really, and it was titillating for me as like an adolescent. It was just like yeah. you know, bare chested men and like little like <laughs> speedos and stuff. speedos, and, yeah. And right. I I was just like, gosh, I mean, how did this end up at the house? Like, um, and I actually don't know. I don't know what my dad or whoever ordered, but uh, <laughs> like that to me. And then you know, just just other little things that I'm like, okay, maybe I remember one time. I said the word penis in the car, like, which is obviously it's, it's a normal, it's an anatomical, it's a word. It's a anatomical, it's a word, it's a a thing. (laughs) It's a part. It's a part. And it's actually the kind, it's actually the most 
scientific word you could use. You know, yes, was it? Right. And anyway, my dad yeah. got so mad at me. Hmm. And for saying it as if I had said, you know, like a swear word or something. So there, yeah. when I look back, I can see like, oh, my dad must have been very unconsciously struggling with something. Um, but yeah, I wasn't, people always think like, oh, you must have been so psyched when your dad came out. I was like, not really. Like I was just kind of, first of all, it's strange, I think, it, or surreal when, when basically someone reveals to you that they are only now the person who they wanted to yeah. be. You start to think, yeah. oh, well then who were you when I was a kid? If, you know, it, it, it really has this way of reconfiguring your own sense of history and the narrative of your family. And there's kind of almost a sadness to think like, oh, this person that I was growing up with wasn't themselves. They weren't their fully realized, you know, self or able to access all the parts of them that help them feel alive or connected. And yeah, so it, there's almost like a grieving process collectively where you're just thinking, oh, like, okay, if you weren't you, then who was I and who am I now? So it, it really, um, I don't know, there's kind of an existential questioning and, and crisis that, that kind of set into play. And also, you know, he just was a different, he did start to become a different person and ultimately in ways that were only better for you know, his relationship with his friends and his relationship with his family, including me. But there was still, I still had to sort of let go of the version of him that I knew, but also find ways of drawing a thread between the old version and the new version. And I think he did too, you know, that he had to sort of embrace the present without fully rejecting who he used to be. Because to reject who he used to be also would be rejecting like the dad he was or is. So it yeah. was it was complicated. I think it's it's easy to just assume, you know, oh, that's so wonderful and so freeing. But right. I think within the context of families and interpersonal dynamics, it's a lot more complex and confusing than that. And you were also 24 when you found out. So you were at a different phase in your life. It's 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 interesting because you you alluded to something about your mom earlier and I completely relate, which is as I get older, I really understand my parents and how they parented much more because I do it myself. You know, I understand the the things that seemed, um, um, you know, harsh or or the the things that I remember that that I didn't like now make much more sense. And in your dad's case, like you could interpret his decision to remain closeted as weirdly like an act of love at a time when that may have may maybe he was worried that it would have brought harm or disrepute or ridicule on you or something like that you know for sure and but on top of that i really think he didn't know it was so yeah. repressed it was just not a part of his his world at all yeah. you know he just he really did not have the language or anything reflecting back onto him who he was. And I think it was a scary exploration for him and obviously a fulfilling one, but it was, yeah. So it, it wasn't easy for him. And I do definitely have empathy for that. Like the fact that he early, early days again of the internet, you know, he was in these sort of chat rooms, uh, first internationally, you know, just like chatting with, you know, men in Europe or Asia, just, and then eventually in the U.S. and then eventually in Seattle. And I just think of even what that journey must have been like, you know, even yeah. though you're ostensibly anonymous as you log on to these chats, but just even to explore something that must have felt so scary and forbidden for him um, does seem very brave for me because he he could have, I think, easily, just as easily continued to to deny that, you know, or not allow himself to even look for it. And I'm glad he did and that it found him and that he found himself. All right. Meantime, you've got this, like, you know, you're part of this, this band. I mean, you're, you're, you're in this band that is really kind of 
blowing up and this is going to be and I know you you said earlier like you didn't have a plan no one really has a plan I mean I guess some people do but most of us didn't um but still it was that was like I mean you know 98 99 the hot rock comes out um you've got this band you're touring um so was it clear to you that this was like your future you were only 24 at the time but I mean I'm thinking when I was 24 I was grinding away at the Washington City paper trying to be a freelance reporter for NPR like but I still like I thought my future was going to be in as a reporter or something like that how is that kind of how you saw your life that this band or making music was was what you were going to do and it was just going to become bigger and bigger and bigger yeah I mean I didn't really know how big it would get or how much bigger we wanted to get again that there was still that idea that that was antithetical to you know i don't know <laughs> the ethics at the time or sort of the the belief at yeah. the time but i did i i thought that i would continue to to play music it did start once i graduated from college and moved to portland it it did feel like music is what i would continue to do uh for the foreseeable future. And did you, I mean, I, obviously you, you acted in high school and so you were interested in acting and you did a couple of like things here and there, um, in the early two thousands. Did you also, was that just kind of a fun thing to explore or were you seriously try, sort of thinking maybe I'll, I'll do some, some acting? I, I would actually say that writing was the thing that felt like it was kind of encroaching or sort of like starting to approach in the, on the periphery that I was like, oh, wait a second, you know, other forms of writing are, are something that I want to explore. And what started happening was, I think people started asking me to write things ab about music or about Slater Kinney. And, yeah. and that was fun for a while, but then almost became it was too meta for me. Like, I just felt like, well, I just want to be playing music. Like, I don't also, yeah. you know, simultaneously want to be explaining what it is or, you know, yeah. sort of put that kind of critical polemical hat on and, you know, dissect it. I just want to do it. And so, but I, at, I was like, but I do like writing. I like, you know, thinking about things. And I also, so that sort of started, I guess, my interest in, just bringing something else into my life besides music. And, um, but yeah, I always did like performing as well, but I really think it was, was the writing that kind of just introduced a, a different world for me. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this is similar, but different from music. And I can kind of write my way into performing or into a different sphere. I mean, you would end up writing for The Believer. You had a blog for NPR Music for a few years, which I loved. Um, that you and and when you started to write and put your stuff out there, um, did you? How, how were you? Do you remember feeling ever feeling self conscious about what you were writing? Like, oh God, people are going to read this. It's not good enough. Or were you comfortable with just putting it out there and and experimenting? I mean, a little of both. I think I I was self-conscious. I mean, especially less so with the blog. I mean, you know, that's sort of the beauty of, yeah. of blogs is that there's a sense of impermanence or a sense of like, okay, this is always a work in progress. You know, there's kind of a fluidity to things that sort of exist in that medium where you can correct and retract and be engaged, I guess, with an audience in a way that feels very alive and mutable. Um, but when something was published in The Believer, you know, I, I definitely had that sort of imposter syndrome of, you know, being, you know, the other writers of putting out novels and all this, you know. I know that around 2003 was the first time you met Fred Armisen. He, I guess you were in New York doing a show. Slater Kinney was playing a show. And, and what happened? Did he reach out and invite you to come to like – a Saturday Night Live after party or something? What What do you remember about that? Yeah, I think Fred and I had, we'd been in the same circles for a long time because he was part of, 
you know, he was in an indie rock band called Trench Mouth. And mm -hmm. I even stayed at his apartment one time when he was out of town. He, um, hmm. But I knew Damon, his roommate, who was also his bandmate in Trench Mouth. So it was like we were adjacent, but not, we never had met. And then I think Janet Weiss, the Slater Kenny drummer, knew Fred. And so she, drummer, yeah. she, we in, got invited to, he had just started on SNL. He was like a featured player or whatever the, the supporting cast is. So we played a right. show, I think at Irving Plaza. And then we went to the after party after our show, the SNL after party. And it was uh, Jennifer Garner and Beck uh, were the guests that night. At the after and, party. Yeah. And after, at the after party. And so I met Fred and, you know, he was, he was wearing a little pin with my face on it. <laughs> Um, Th these what, are pins that you would sell at the shows, like at, yeah, at your, right, yeah. And, yeah. So that must have been what album? It was either One Beat or All Hands on the Bad One. We had put out these little mm -hmm. Slater Kinney pins where there was photos of each of us with a koala that we had taken in Australia, <laughs> and he was wearing that that pin. And did you know he was a super fan? No, I didn't. I mean, you I had no idea. Well, well, I mean, when he was wearing the pin, I guess I was. I started to have a clue that he was yeah. a super fan, but, uh, yeah, he, I mean, to this day, he still loves Slater Kinney. Uh, he is, he is a super fan about a lot of things. I mean, he's just, you know, he, he carries that enthusiasm with him, uh, to this day about a lot of things. So you meet him that night and it would, it would be another eight years before you would do Portlandia, which we're, we're going to talk about in a minute, but did, what, what happened? Did you guys say, you know, let, I mean, what do you remember about that conversation? Was there ever like any like, we should do something together one day? Like we should really do something, figure something, anything out? I think not that night, but definitely like it must have been just the next year because it was the um, 2004 election and mm -hmm. Fred had been asked to make a video it would have been for John Kerry. Like it would have been, that would have been the election that year, right? 2004. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, sure. so he, I don't know if it was specifically for the Kerry campaign or just, I don't even know what it was. It was all dubious, but he said, I need to make this video and would you want to be in it? Uh, I'll come to Portland. And I just thought, And it was, okay. a, was, it was a comedy video or was like a music? It was a comedy, it was a comedy okay. video. He was playing... This is so Fred. He was playing Saddam Hussein, who, um, who was hiding out in his bunker. But he imagined that Saddam Hussein. He played him like he was like Paul Weller. He was like Don't a you British think, rocker. Like, yeah, I've yeah. seen that video. It's so yes. weird. It, it's it, so he's talking weird. like a Brit yeah, and you were interviewing him like in, in an earnest way. That was so. That was the video that he was asked to do for the Kerry campaign. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, there's no way that oh God, if, I, I mean, I first of all, I, I might, I might have my facts wrong. Cause I also do not imagine that the John Kerry campaign was like, now this is a video we should use. <laughs> this uh, is the no one. Yeah. <laughs> this is the one. Um, and so I played Cindy Overton, uh, a host of a show called Boink, <laughs> which was basically just like a basement, you know, sort of like cable access show. And I got like yeah. the first bunker interview with Saddam Hussein, who then gives all these PSAs, like don't do drugs. And, you know, I just, it was very and He's talking weird. about like corporations and how evil they are, like all these things. It's so yeah. weird. So weird. So that's where we, that was, that was the first thing we did. And then slowly we just started making like whenever we could, whenever we sort of, you know, our free time aligned he would come to Portland, although I think one time we, I went to New York once too, and we would just make these little videos and we called them, we called our duo Thunder Ant. And we just put them yeah. up online, sent them to our friends. And eventually we sort of had, you know, five or six videos and they were starting to get kind of specific and we were developing this rapport yeah. and they had a certain sensibility. And, you know, that was the foundation of Portlandia. But did he – when he started to, to just he, say, hey, I'm going to come out to Portland. Let's make just some video because really it was for the two – it was just really just like scratching an itch. Like it was just for fun. Mm -hmm. Did he have like – I know that – because if you see them, because you can find them online, like the production values are very low. But obviously it's Fred and you and so 
it's really funny. Like there's one sketch where like you go to a one man show in Portland and it's just you and the like he's like, Yeah, you'll be on the on the guest list and you go to like Will Call and they're like, No, you're on the guest list and then you're the only one in the theater watching him in this one man show. Um but but like did you have did he get like somebody he must have gotten somebody to film it? Like we're using a handy cam, like how are how do you how are you making them? Yeah, I mean, it was all very just fly by night. Like he would show up, we would go to Goodwill and get what would, you know, be our costumes. We would come up with an idea. Yeah. We would ask uh one of our friends, still a friend to this day, um our friend Patrick, he would, you know, take time out of his day and, and film us and then we would we would have someone edit it and it was it was kind of i just assumed when fred first you know wanted to collaborate with me that w- we were going to do music but then when i when we realized that this was something that we wanted to do just for fun i really enjoyed it like it was just a way of sort of i i like friendships like that that are sort of like project based yeah how did he know i mean if you if if somebody knew of you they would have thought of you as a musician right unless they knew you in high school and knew you as an actor and you had done some acting a little bit, but how did he know? Like, because you would have thought when he was like, because he's a musician, he would have been like, let's do something together. Let's make music. Like, that's what you would have thought would have happened. Same here. That's what I thought. I think what happened was we made that first piece, you know, the boink piece or whatever you want to call it. And at that time, I was, a, you know, I wasn't playing a musician, but I was playing someone that was kind of hosting a music cable access show because also yeah. Saddam Hussein, of course, was a guitar player uh, <laughs> in, in uh, Fred's logic of this. So I think what happened was we did that. And then Fred thought, oh, like you're, you know how to do this. Like this is something that, you know, you're enjoying and that we kind of have a chemistry. So I don't, I don't think, yeah. I think it sort of was one step at a time where we did that thinking it would just be this fun one-off. And then we just really enjoyed it. And he realized that I was sort of at the time able to keep up with him. And then, you know, of course, I learned how to keep with, up with him better and better over the years. But yeah, so I, I don't think when we when we did the first video that he thought, OK, well, you're he just thought, well, this will be fun and then we'll see what happens from there. Because he he always is. Coll- I mean, he is such a collaborator. He's always, you know, yeah. working with Mark Mothersbaugh or doing something with the B-52s or, you know, just uh, – He's just all over the place with that stuff. So I think he just he has an appetite for it. He has a curiosity, and he just he I think he's always looking for people that aren't the most expected, you know, sort of interlocutors. What's amazing about it is like you start making these videos in two thousand four, right? And you would do it for like four or five years, and there was no like there were no agents, there was no infrastructure, there was no complexity. It was just like, hey, it was not like, it wasn't even, hey, let's workshop this and one day maybe we'll make a television show. It was like, this is fun, I think, right? Like he was like, this is really fun. I like you. I think you're fun and interesting. Let's just do fun stuff. And who knows what the purpose of this will be? Is that what it was? Yeah. And I think for me, that was probably the only way I would have understood kind of how to how to do that because it was so yeah. analogous to the organic nature of Slater Kinney, you know, that it had it grew out of friendship, it grew out of a, a like mindedness. And same with Thunder Ant and working with Fred, you know, it just we were friends and we enjoyed doing this thing and we weren't, you know, th- there wasn't just this ambition that, well, this is our end goal. Um, and I think we were really lucky in that way that we were able to kind of like develop it out of the purview or spotlight or judgment of, you know, a, a producer who was trying yeah. to push it in one direction or another. I mean, that's very rare. And I, I think it's happened with other people too, you know, you it, like Issa Rae, for instance, you know, or Broad City, like a lot of things have come out of like a more mm-hmm. organic starting place. And it, it's, it's YouTube. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, I, I feel fortunate, but it also was familiar to me. You know, I think if if it had been like structured as like, okay, well, my agent is going to reach out to you and there's this right, producer right. network that's been interested. A, it would never have happened. Wouldn't have happened. They would have replaced me in a second with, you know, one of his SNL co-stars or, you know, it did, and which I still can't believe, you know, that, that Lauren Michaels, who was the executive producer, 
of Portlandia never said like, hey, you know, we're so glad that you have this friend Carrie, but let's bring, you know, Kristen Wiig in yeah. or Maya or, you know, right. I mean, it was a leap of faith, I think. And what's amazing about that, too, is it gave you a chance to kind of workshop to become a comedic actor. Like you really had like uh, on the one hand, what what I find so remarkable about this period, because it's like six, seven years is you weren't doing it with Fred thinking, I think, thinking this is going to lead to a show where I'm going to be a, a lead in this show with Fred. It was like, this is fun and I'm just stretching a different part of myself and I'm having fun and I'm, I'm just kind of getting better at this thing. Exactly. That it, that was the only goal was the enjoyment of it, collaborating with a, you know, a director or a friend of ours or an editor friend and, you know, getting to hang out, you know, a couple days of the year with with Fred and and kind of learn how to do this. And it was there was no money. You weren't like d- doing it for money. There's no money. It was just you're just putting it out there. It was like probably didn't cost that much to make. There was no money. We definitely weren't making money. And I was, I didn't have enough money to, I mean, Fred, it was self-funded by Fred, (laughs) you know, just, yeah, uh, yeah. it was, it was just for fun. And I think, you know, that, that is so crucial. It's so, it is so rare as well, you know, to just have the luxury to do something that isn't about like, how can we monetize this? Uh, You know, that, that does not happen very often. I think Almost any time now, you you have an idea. You're thinking, "What's the next step? How can we make this bigger? How can we grow our audience?" Yeah, uh, which is fine. But I just it literally just wasn't what we were thinking of at the time. You know, it, it wasn't about capitalizing on it. Which is why the ultimate result of it, which was not part of the plan, was amazing. But what was before I I, ta- I asked you about Portlandia. What what I also find remarkable is that because around this time, 2006. Slater Kinney goes on hiatus, indefinite hiatus, and you, you were, you were dealing with a lot of, a lot of personal challenges. Like, I mean, and I talked about this, like depression, anxiety, and um, just like, I mean, even to the point where you were, you were getting panic attacks, like, um, at shows, before shows, after shows. What was going on? What, what do you remember about that time? Because, I mean, you guys were. So acclaimed, so critically acclaimed. I mean, you had such a devoted fan base. You still do. But you were really like, you know, on one level, you'd sort of made it as this really renowned indie band. And on the other hand, you were like internally just kind of a a, a mess. So what was going on? Yeah, I'm, you know, I think a lot of it was just that I had never taken the time to sort of deal with my childhood, with my mom leaving, with this anxiety and depression that was just so permeating and sometimes very debilitating. And I think until that point, this is right around when I was 30, music had been a way of working through those things, you know, that, and, and yeah. tour was a way of, of staying busy. And, you know, I was, I was kind of able to like spin these plates, multiple plates at once and not really notice as much that, you know, there was something, there was a, a sadness and a tenderness and an anger that I had, had not really dealt with except through music, which is a, sure a great way of, of processing that, but it's not a, permanent solution, you know, and and I think eventually that caught up with me that I just needed moments, a, a moment to just actually explore this in a way that, you know, wasn't about being on stage or writing songs and, you know, escaping it through tour. I was never someone that relied on drugs or alcohol, thankfully, you know, I just, but in inside of me, yeah, I just was very, very anxious. And it was just getting darker and darker. Um, and yeah, I, I think I just, I really needed a break from the band at the same time. I think Corin did as well. She was, she had a kid and it was hard to tour and, you know, it, it came, it, the, the break was natural, but it was also really difficult because suddenly I was just thrust out into the world, not really knowing who I was or what my identity was, or if I wanted to continue playing music. 
But uh, yeah, I, st- I started going to therapy and taking medication for depression and anxiety and just kind of s- sorting things out in a way that was more intentional instead of just assuming that, you know, you could kind of get by with these like moments of reprieve or with distraction or avoidance. Yeah. That definitely catches up to you. And, and I will say, because I see people with debilitating anxiety and depression and when you're around someone who's anxious, that is the only energy that's allowed in that room. You know, you are just yeah. at the mercy of that kind of erratic, unpredictable behavior. And, yeah. I, you know, I just, I don't, I, it's hard for me to be around it now when other people are exhibiting that. And I'm, and I think it was hard for, for my bandmates to be around my, my anxiety then, you know, it just was very, very chaotic. So it was good that we stopped. Yeah. That point that you make about um about it kind of it 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 kind of takes over everything for you. I mean, yeah, I mean similarly, I I I had a similar experience where you know, for several years also I was outwardly like, you know, successful and on CNN and as a reporter and and inwardly just tormented and I I couldn't totally explain it. Um and and I I think what um, you know medication helped, but also I think it's a lot. Of, what a lot of people don't know when they're going through it is that there is a for most of, most of the time there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Like it it will you will get through it. You know. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is a common age. Late there's sort of you know these periods like late teens yeah. and late twenties. I think is is very common for yeah. for that depression to kind of rear its its ugly head and uh yeah I I definitely found the other side of it and it, it improved a lot of my my friendships and just my ability to kind of be be present with people and so that was good. You wrote later on like if you're wondering how sad I was um the the year that that we stopped touring I was also the Oregon Humane Society Volunteer of the Year Award in 2006 because you got really into like taking care of like fostering dogs, right? And not fostering, but I was – yeah, so I started volunteering at the Oregon Humane Society in Portland and I just <laughs> dove headfirst into that. I mean I got in there and I was like, we need to start some new programs. Let's start the great eight. The great eight was me highlighting the dogs, the oh eight God. dogs that had been there the longest. And I would spend, I made a whole banner. So when you walked into the to the shelter, you would see this this giant like display. I had these cute pictures of the eight dogs and a little description. <laughs> and then on their kennel, it would say, Hi, I'm part of the great eight. And then oh I was also God walking dogs. I was um, wow. hosting in the lobby. So when people came in, I would have a dog out there to greet people. <laughs> uh, I started doing dog training. Wow. And this was what was so weird was that I was still doing dog training when Portlandia started. Wow. So I was I was the assistant dog trainer at a private oh, facility. Oh my God. <laughs> and at Oregon Humane Society. And people would come into class and be like, aren't you the are you on TV? Like, are you in a band? And I'm like, yes. Now sit down, get your dog into a, you know. <laughs> You're like, I mean, I of course, all I can think about is Kath oh, on Portlandia. Guy, I, you know what? My friends have been really making fun of me lately because I have fully, <laughs> Kath was always, as are almost any Portlandia character, a, a small part of who I am or could right. be. Right. But Kath right. is someone who has, unfortunately, I find myself turning more and more into. Um, it's this very sten- stentorian uh, <laughs> sort of personality. Um, but yes, Kath is a great dog trainer. Great dog yeah. trainer. <laughs> All right. So during that period, I mean, you, you know, it wasn't like you were kind of not doing anything. You were doing a bunch of different things and you were doing these these things with Fred and these videos and you were doing a lot of writing. And I mean, even some of the characters that you would eventually would eventually be on Portlandia were developed during this time, like Tony and Candace, I think, when you and Fred were making these like informal videos that you would just put up, that was how you developed those. The the, the for people who don't know, I think most people listening will know the feminist bookstore owners. That's that really started on Thunder Ant, right? 
Yeah, I think it was the second thing we did after that weird boink video, or maybe the third thing. We did like a bicycle rights thing, and then we did Tony and Candace at a at a bookstore. Yeah, and th- and they became, you know, characters that we, you know, had all eight seasons of the show. How did the idea for for Portlandia come about? I, I remember I, I interviewed you when I used to work at NPR. Um, when when Wild Flags record came out and I I read the transcript, it's a little embarrassing because I'm like, you've got a super group. And you're like, I don't know if I'd call it a super group. Um, but uh, anyway, it was a great album and it was a fun interview. But that was right when Portlandia was starting. I didn't know it yet. Um, so how did the idea come about? Like, was there a point where after just a few years of making these videos, one one of you guys said the other like, okay, I think maybe we should make a show. I I will credit... Fred's manager at the time, who then became my manager, Tim Sarkis, uh, he said to Fred, like, you guys, this is a show. Why, you know, like you, you've you done six or seven videos. You have a chemistry and a dynamic. It's starting to feel specific and interesting. And I, what if you guys, why don't you guys film almost like a a pilot episode or just sort of, you know, do like a five to 10 minute sort of pitch video. And, and we did. And what happened was because Fred was under contract at SNL, he was required to show it to Broadway video, which is Lauren Michaels production company. He assumed that Lauren would say, this is great. This is not for me. <laughs> you have my blessing. Go and try to take it out uh, right. to someone else. But instead, Lauren and Andrew Singer, who runs uh, the television department at Broadway Video, said, no, we we love this. We'd love to, to help you out and produce it. And so then we went out with Broadway Video and pitched it. And uh, yeah, I remember we pitched it to Comedy Central and they said, uh, we are just no one does sketch shows, which of course, after Portlandia came out, Comedy Central did Key and Peele and the Amy yeah. and the Schumer show. But um, that's right. fine. Uh, and then IFC at the time were just starting to move away from you know the independent film channel showing you know Tarantino films or whatever, and they were like, yeah. we're going to do original programming. It kind of just timed out, you know. They were, and again, it just it all just felt so. Uh, familiar to me like ifc were kind of like an indie label you know there's this Mm -hmm. they didn't they just no one was doing original programming there we we were such an experiment it felt it felt so much like deja vu to just you know and they were great they were super supportive and you know definitely it found a home there but you know we we definitely were not signing on with some established network It, it was you know everything felt like a startup and it was a slow burn like people Everyone knows Portlandia now, but like for the first few years, this is like before viral videos were really, you know, so it was like a couple of years before, you know, it would really take off, even though the people who saw it loved it. It was acclaimed, but right, it was, it was, it was not like a massive hit right away. No, and I think it's, it's still one of those shows and many shows occupy this space where, you know, the critical reception was largely good. It had... Um, you know, it, it, it sort of entered the lexicon, whether it was, you know, put a bird on it. You, you started, you started seeing other, you know, article headlines, put a blank you on it. You know, it. Yeah, exactly. There was, it, it sort of crept into popular culture, but I think the actual numbers, the amount of eyeballs on the show was relatively small, you know, and, and it wasn't until Netflix started airing it, um, that it, it became something that more people saw. I mean, IFC was sort of deep on the, on the cable, you know, package. And, um, yeah, it was a little bit of a slow burn. Um, before I keep going, it's 11. I was meant, we were meant to finish this interview 20 minutes ago, but I have another probably 15 minutes, but I don't want to, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, how are you with time? I, I just have something at 1130. So if I could finish at like 1115 so I can have a snack Promise or something. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. We we totally it's it's nice, it's so natural and normal to talk to you. Plus we just vamped for fifteen minutes at the top of the I'm sorry. It was my I yeah, okay. All right. I'm gonna be disciplined. So you know, one of the I mean, one of the amazing I've watched a lot of videos of you and Fred kind of talking about your creative process and how you think about sketches, but it's still remarkable to me when I watch that show, just all of the intricacies involved and every like every little detail like let, let's just kind of break down 
you know, like one of the – like just a random sketch, right? Um, did you read it? It's a famous one. If anyone who's seen Portlandia knows that sketch, did you read it? Did you read it? It's you and Fred in a cafe and you're like, yeah, I just read this article in the New York Times. Oh, I read that. Did you – and then Fred's one-ups you. I just saw this piece in the New Yorker. Oh, I read that. Or, you know, did you read it? And then and then you, it just keeps getting more and more obscure until in the, in the end that you're just like going through the phone book. Did you read it? Yeah. And then and you're ripping up the phone book and it's just – and then you get hit by a car. <laughs> You're just both flat on the ground, dead. Um, how do you? How did like help me understand like the germ of an idea into a sketch that just feels so tight and like everything from the costumes to the location to the dialogue to the music used. How did how do you put all those pieces together? So that's a sketch from the first season. I was very green as a writer, and I will always credit a woman named Allison Silverman, who we brought in. She had come from the Colbert show. She is a just a very experienced writer, uh, first in that um, context, but now all over um, a ton of comedy shows that people have seen, uh, most recently Russian Doll. And she... You know, I was very nervous in a, a writer's room. I, even though it was just me and Jonathan Kreisel, who was our director and co-creator, and Fred mm -hmm. and Allison, I was still nervous. I mean, Fred knew how to pitch, and you know, Allison obviously had been in writers' rooms. So I remember saying that, you know, I was like, I have this idea. You know, people are always one upping each other with, you know, did you read this? Did you read that? And you know, and I because I didn't know how to pitch, it just sort of. Yeah, you know, someone wrote it on the board. And then I remember Allison came in, like, you know, we came back the next day and she said, I, I, th I think I really like this idea of Carrie's. And she sort of, she was the one that really turned that into a sketch. You know, I just had the idea and she's like, it, it would escalate like this. And, you know, she, she just was so helpful and so instructive to me early on that I'm always grateful for her. So anyway, so that's how it kind of went from just an idea, like, which is often what it is, you know, an observation, an anecdote, a phenomenon that, you know, we've been witnessing. And then how do we turn that into something? And and the, if there was a formula, I thought, think for Portlandia, the most successful one was a grounded idea that becomes absurd, that becomes surreal. That's that's sort of the best version of it. And so that's exactly what that is. You know, it's, it starts yeah. out with a very real scenario. conversation. Yeah. Which, yeah. you know, we all we find ourselves doing or we witness. And then, yeah, it gets to something absurd. And then at the end, it's just bonkers, bizarre. And then, you know, I remember that sc specific one. It was at the end of the day. We had a grueling production schedule. We were sometimes shooting four sketches a day. And this is a huge task for our production designer, for our costume, hair and makeup, for the entire crew. It is, it's really difficult. Yeah. So I remember it was like six o'clock and we, we, Fred and I were like, let's just not do it. Let's not do this sketch. Like, please, like, it's just, everyone's tired. And Jonathan, our director was like, no, no, let's, let's do it. And yeah, we, we just went into that cafe and, we sort of had, this is when we were doing mostly improv, like very Curb Your Enthusiasm, where you sort of just had a, here's like the story arc. And yeah. and later it became a little more scripted, but we sort of had these prompts. We had like, okay, here's a list of things that you might read. And, you know, we were drawing from our own lives and then also this very loose script. But a lot of it came together in the editing, you know, just that um, we had great editors, um, at the time, Doug Lusenhop, Dan Longino. I mean, they just really wanted things to be percussive. There was all, always, I yeah. think, a musicality to Portlandia. Yes. Especially those early seasons, you know, whether it was uh, Fred on the bike, you know, going through town, uh, or did you read, you know, there's there's just this, this rhythm to it, this percussion, and that sketch really has that. Like, you can almost, it almost seems like a, a drum uh, improvisation. You know, you can just yep. feel that beat come in. Um, anyway, that's, that's that. So you would record or you would film a scene and, and basically just, just go and then they would, they would edit it down and, and allow those moments to just kind of that. Did you read this? Did you read that? But then they were, cause I imagine to film something like that, especially in your first season when you're still feeling a little nervous, 
um, you know, I don't know. Did you have to do multiple takes of of sketches? We did multiple takes. We also, you know, we cross covered, which basically just means that instead of shooting directionally, like, okay, we're going to shoot this actor and then we're going to turn around and the camera's going to get the other actor. Right. The problem with that with improv is that if you're only on Fred and I say something funny or that works, when we turn around, the script supervisor has to say, okay, and then you said this thing. Do it again. Yeah. So what's nice is, you know, you're also everything's digital now or, you know, some films are on film, but everything's digital. You can do these long takes. So we would just do these long takes. We're both on camera and, you know, then we cut and we might repeat something or we might just try a whole other thing. So there was a looseness to it. That was nice. Uh, um, and we weren't limited by, you know, okay, well, this take is only going to be 30 seconds. Like we could, there were yeah. takes sometimes not on that sketch, but other sketches, 20 to 30 minute takes where Fred would just run off on some tangent. And I'll, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we thought the sketch was about that. But then now this sketch is about this whole other thing that Fred just came up with. I feel like, so, I mean, I can, we can talk about Portlandia for, for hours and hours because I, um, I just think the show is so smart. I mean, you know, Amy Mann as your cleaning lady, or um, or, or like the, the the one where like you discover that your Uber driver can rate you, and I remember discovering that, thinking like, oh my god, I, I'm I'm rated on Uber, and you weren't happy with your your rating, and then you end up with a with Steve Buscemi as the driver, and he takes you to a gun store, and you're like, yeah, sure, I love guns, but but every moment and every sketch seemed so well thought out, like um, you know, one of the famous ones, what about men? It's a music video and you guys are like riding bikes you're like yeah there's no movement for men you know there's there are all these movements for other groups but what about men and and but but in the video like there's moments where you're wearing costumes of like the founders and there's a just a a split second where you're holding a birdhouse and you're like we invented this too and um there's a rap with a bullhorn and um what about dennis there's like just like just randomly what about dennis and it, it strikes me that that your the theme of your life and career has also really been about collaborating with smart people, like just finding people that you really just there's an energy, you know, like whether it's Slater Kinney and you're making that music or it's Portlandia and all these people coming together to just create these tight moments. And I, I, I just I guess that that really is like how you approach things. It's it's finding other people and just building something together. Yeah. You know, I think so much, I do love collaborating. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, this idea of the, the lone genius, I think is, is a, a little uh, strange to me. I mean, I think it's something that yeah. people have been kind of chipping away at and dismantling and realizing that most things, most, so much in our world is a, is a, is a group effort, you know, is a lot of people coming together to make something. And while there might be a central figure, you know, it takes a lot of people to, to put things out in the world. And I just like that as a way of connecting with other people. You know, I, there are some things I do by myself, like write a memoir, but I really enjoy that way of communion and, and just, and, and connection is, is to, get into a room and to think about things and to dissect and examine and, and also just to find joy and levity in it. And I, yeah, I, it's one of my favorite things to do and I really thrive on it. Um, so yeah, I would say collaboration is probably the common, the common theme. And, um, it's also just, it's probably, I think we, when we you know you were, we were talking earlier about that time in my life where I was very anxious or, depressed. And I think that there is a vulnerable, there, it, collaboration, artistic collaboration was kind of the first time I was really able to be vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I spent so much of my childhood, like sort of building a wall around myself to sort of protect me from a lot of sadness and hurt. And so when I was doing music with Slater Kinney or, you know, working in a writer's room on Portlandia, like that's when I could be like sensitive and to show who I was and to allow people in. And of course now I can 
luckily do that in the rest of my life. But I think I really valued it as um, a sounding board, a way of of trying out how to be more human, more compassionate, you know, more just open. And so I returned to collaboration over and over again, because I think you always find something about yourself and you all also learn that it takes, sometimes it takes someone else to better your idea and that's okay. You know, that's, yeah. that kind of cooperation is, is really, I think the ideal way of moving through the world. We just, we aren't autonomous beings. We need each other. And, and, and right. I don't, I don't mind making art from that place. You know, I think that's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't need to be standing alone on a, on a pedestal. I, you know, I'd rather sort of have a lot of people around me and, and feel like I'm part of something and feel like I belong. One of the very remarkable things you've managed to do, and very, very few people, creative people, get to do this or f- figure out how to do this, is to embody completely different worlds, right? Like, you know, if you're if you're an amazing musician, like people think of you that way, or or you know, but you have this Portlandia world, right? And then you go on stage and I mean, you're on tour now and people go to those shows and they see you as this performer, guitarist, musician. But then um, like you can see you in a completely different context as this comedic actor and also writer. First of all, had like, did you have any, was there any like weird sort of transition to with fans or people like, wait, that's you too like or did it did it just feel natural to people what do you what do you remember about how people responded to you seeing you in this role on portlandia well for one i think i went the right way it's easier to go from musician to something on film and television than the other way people i think less so now because you know yeah. there's people are very um just for forgiving and accepting of things and you know polymaths but again sort of that that mentality that from which I came, which was a little more strident and, you know, it was like, okay, you can go from musician to actor, but actor to musician, no, you know, like it's just, there's uh, much more skepticism, you know, when, when people go that way. So I had that, but then I think there was a little bit, especially Slater Kinney, it means, you know, one thing that I'm so grateful for is it is a band that means a lot to people that people have a very personal connection to and almost a sense of ownership over, you know, and, and it's, it's something that they feel, yeah, they just feel protective of. So I think a little bit, there were some people that were sort of worried that as I ventured into a different context or a different world, that that might, you know, sort of affect that sanctity, I guess, of, of music. But for me, not only did it not, but I, it is just kind of exploring two sides of myself. I mean, I, I think there is not a version of Slater Kinney that, you know, sort of revels in absurdity. You know, there's, it's always, there's something that's going to be earnest about it and something that is very sacred to me. But yeah. I also think that, you know, the lens of absurdism is is sometimes how I have to process the world. And I think a lot of people, you know, have to make sense of the world is, is through the ways that it, it doesn't make sense that it that it's surreal and strange and defies our expectations and you know so that comedic part of myself i think was important too for just you know comprehension and making sense of things but i do still get a lot of people just realizing oh you're the same person which i don't mind <laughs> like okay you know i i uh it all makes sense to me but it's fine if it doesn't make sense to other people I know that you are you were like involved in directing a film and um and you were doing some writing, maybe like working on a biopic of Heart. I I know I don't know if all of those are on, but can you tell me a little bit about I mean, can you imagine doing another comedic series, like another television show? Can you imagine or is there is that even an ambition or when you think about some of the other things you want to do, where does your, like, where does that lead you to? I think one thing that I've realized, both with Slater Kinney and with Portlandia, like, they're so singular. And I, to recreate that is almost impossible. And I just feel fortunate 
that I've had both. You know, I think eight, getting to do a TV show for eight seasons is unbelievable, you know, and, and that it started out the way it did. And I just met so many wonderful people. Like, I, I don't think I'll have that specific thing again. I also am not someone who is trying to build an empire, or needs a, you know, an overall deal somewhere, or, you know, but I, I like, I just, I'm drawn to things that, where I get to work with people whom I admire and um, who I like. And I would like to do another TV show eventually, but I also, I've been directing TV and I am supposedly maybe going to direct a movie. I, I like kind of being behind the camera or in the, in the background a little bit. I don't, I don't mind that. I like the rigor of it. And I, I like working with a team of people, you know, a, a crew. So I'm not exactly sure. I mean, honestly, I would be fine to just like live out on a farm and, um, you know, do dog agility or something. Like I just, as, as I get older, I feel more content, almost returning to that place of being an observer, you know, being a witness, just enjoying mm -hmm. things and not feeling like I'm yeah. just, you know, trying for the next rung on the ladder. Like that's not yeah. as interesting to me as just engaging with people around me and trying to be a better person and do good things. Like that's, that's just as important to me. And, and that kind of involves just being where I am outside of LA or New York. So yeah, I'm not sure, but um, I'm sure that there'll be something else, but I want it to have meaning to me and not just be for the sake of content. <laughs> I love that. Carrie, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy. It's been a real pleasure. Hey, thanks so much for watching my conversation with Carrie Brownstein. We'll link to some of the music and comedy sketches that we talked about in the show notes. Just go to the greatcreators.com slash Brownstein. And I highly, highly encourage you to check out the two-minute Portlandia sketch uh, called Did You Read It? It is so funny. Just trust me. All right. For more videos like this one, please be sure to click the subscribe button somewhere below my fingers. Um, and if you want to be notified when we drop a new video, also, uh, please just adjust the notifications in YouTube. Tap that little bell icon. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Check out all of our interviews at thegreatcreators.com. I'm Guy Raz. You've been watching The Great Creators, and I'll see you here next time.